Okay, thanks, and thanks to everyone for running from Dominic Palsland, sort of like up and down the stairs and all of that. I know it's a hot day. Um, today, myself, uh, coupled with Mike Johnson and Lisa Fentress, who's here. Mike Johnson's in London. He works for LP Archaeology. Um, are going to talk a little bit about the background and excavation at the site of Villa Magna in uh, Lazio in Italy, um, and how the sort of our site practices and data recording has impacted our publication plans. So we'll look at some of the problems we're encountering in our online publication um, and some of the solutions that we're coming up with to try and make sure that our online publication is as sustainable as we can sort of, as we can make it. So the Villa Magna project was a series of excavations running from 2006 to 2010, um, a project jointly organized by the British School at Rome and the University of Pennsylvania um, under the direction of Lisa Fentress, who is in the audience today. Um, it was the excavation of a site identified in texts as the imperial residence of Antoninus Pius, uh, specifically in the writings of Marcus Aurelius uh, to his tutor Fronto. So Marcus Aurelius speaks at length about this sort of wonderful bucolic experience he's having in the countryside. He's listening to servants make the wine. He's hunting. He's farming. Sort of like a, an early agriturismo. Um, the site was later a monastery, and after that, still a seigneurial residence, and then in the 19th century was, was constructed as a farmhouse. Um, so at, at modern day, the remains on the site include sort of this 19th century farmhouse, but also the church of San Pietro in Villamagna, which is the late uh, first millennium, and it's still sort of standing. So the excavations at this site were sort of to understand the, the nature and the um, extent of surviving villa remains, um, also to look diachronically at the landscape, so excavating in the area of the monastery, the area of the villa, and an area, a third area, area D, which you can see sort of up north and to the northeast on this site, um, which was the location of a slave barracks. And because we're an archaeology conference, and sometimes it's nice to look at pictures of archaeology, um, it's impossible and not really the point of this to summarize all the things we uncovered. It was five years. There was a lot of materials. Uh, but what we did sort of see is the in the top area, we can see this in 2006, working in the area of the Casale, which is a sort of imperial winery and dining complex, and also bathing. So sort of very elaborate. We can see it in the plan um, in a sort of a mashup of photos taken of various years on the bottom left here. This sort of dining complex where the emperor would be carried up the stairs in a litter. He'd do some nice ceremonial things with the first sort of must of the grapes. And then he would eat as the servants made their wine. Um, we could see in the bottom right, as we were excavating the cemetery of a medieval church, obviously they're also involved the excavation and the recording and the digitizing of more skeletons than I would ever really care to look at again. Um, so we really have a very of a variety of different types of archaeological materials, a variety of different types of data uh, dating to different periods, um, and also for interest in different scholars. We're not only speaking in our publication to Romanists or medievalists or whatever. We're really trying to hit up anyone who wants to hear from us. To manage our data, starting in 2006, uh, Villamani implemented the ARC database. Uh, Jess talked about this earlier on Tuesday. Um, this is an entity attribute value system. Um, which was developed by LP Archaeology in London and emerged largely out of their work on commercial sites and also the Fasti Online project. So Fasti Online is using the same code as, as ARC, as Villamagna. It's a modular web-based system using a sort of standard package of Apache, MySQL, and the PHP libraries. Um, and it uses these PHP scripts to pull sort of fragments of data. This is my, my sticky note version of what it's doing, because it's sometimes easier than making crazy charts with things flying everywhere. Um, but it's pulling these fragments of data live through sort of PHP configuration and attaching them to the primary record. And so that allows a great amount of flexibility, because which fragments of data you're pulling can depend on where you're viewing it, what types of forms you're viewing it in, who's viewing it, whether you're the project director or a digger. Um, so it's got a lot of flexibility. And Villa Magna really was one of the early adopters of ARC for site recording. Um, Villa Magna was using the ARC database before the first sort of public release of the ARC database. And Villa Magna, as a result, is also sort of serving as one of these bleeding edge sort of example projects when it comes to opening up this project data and publishing this project data. I guess if you're an early adopter of one aspect, you're an early adopter of the other. So, so the team has been very flexible and patient with us as we sort of work some of these things out. 
And sort of tying into to Jess Ogden's lightning talk on Tuesday, um, I think it's important to sort of reflect on what the goals of ARC development were and how those things are connected to the goals of Villamania project and the way that that sort of system is developed. So the, the ARC database was developed specifically so that it was multivocal, reflexive, integrated, and online. Um, and this is kind of the same ideas that Villamania as, as a project under the guidance of Lisa really tried to also instill in the people working there. So the stratigraphy of various trenches was always intended to be published and sort of discussed by trench supervisors and not by some sort of power on high. Um, all the data included on the site was sort of concurrently processed, so the, the project was designed to be reflexive. Um, we wanted all of the types of data integrated in a single place, which is one of the reasons the ARC sort of developed in that way. And because we had an international projects team, it was important that our data was online after every excavation season, and so this sort of web-based system emerged partially to do with the sort of development needs of LP archaeology, but also responding to the needs of the Villamania project. So how do we publish this sort of, this sort of mishmash of open, reflexive, integrated, and online data? Well, in the concept for Villamania, there's, this is sort of a hybrid print and digital publication. It's these days getting more and more expensive, as most people will know, to actually publish giant fat print excavation monographs. Um, and we still want to have a foot giant fat print excavation monograph, and we do have a giant fat print excavation monograph um, coming out in the autumn of this year. Um, however, it's instead of having several monographs, one for finds catalogs, one for stratigraphic narrative, we want to have the, the single print monograph sort of paired with this online aspect. So people, finds catalogs are more useful if you can search them in any case anyway than trying to scan through a print monograph of finds catalogs. If it's online, you can have as many photos as you want, as opposed to having one photo in a print, traditional print uh, monograph. So it's sort of more options if we have this hybrid model of print and online to integrate the types of data that we need. Um, however, if we then sort of, publication always involves some sort of loss of control to some extent of, of the project. And so as you give your materials to a publisher, they impose certain restrictions on you in terms of length, in terms of content, in terms of formatting. And so there's sometimes a tendency for digital publication to fall under the same thing. So if you're publishing in a digital journal, the digital journal still tells you what it is you're supposed to do. And Villamania was sort of trying to develop more of a, a bespoke or kind of DIY system where the project is not losing that editorial control of what it is they're doing um, when, they're, when they're publishing. So we can see here the sort of split, the print volume will include um, sort of chronological narrative, regional background, um, sort of wider significance, interpretation largely of the site. And the online will include the stratigraphic narratives that sort of led to those interpretations and the data that's sort of behind all of that. Um, so survey, object catalogs, other specialist information, uh, physical anthropology, these types of things. Now, of course, these things are not so easy to do, and it's sort of easier to think about what you want to do, but it's not always so easy to predict the future. Um, so this is probably not the first XKCD that people have seen at CAA, and it's not going to be the last, because I have one later. Um, and I apologize in advance for making everyone feel a little bit old, but when we adopted this system at Villamania, it was before really people were using Facebook particularly widely. Certainly Twitter, which I've been on for the last four days, was not a thing that was discussed. Uh, our initial website, which is still on these, used text pattern as its content management system. Um, I'm not sure if text pattern still exists, but I certainly don't think it's very widely used anymore. Uh, it was the early days of Google products, before Google sort of controlled all your information. Um, and your life, uh, and the early days of semantic web and sort of these discussions of linked data. And so, and this is still only 10 years ago. And so there's sort of this concept of we, we'll do our best to try and predict what's going to happen in the future. Um, but I almost feel like all data is kind of born legacy data because you're always dealing with a situation where you have absolutely no idea of, of saying what's going to happen next. And like three months after collecting some data, it might be that it's no longer the cutting edge thing that you want to do. So what we'd like to do now, I guess, with the rest of my time is look at some of these, the wider issues we've experienced and some of the things that we thought, our sort of thought processes as we moved from this raw data to how we thought we'd want to put it online. Um, this is obviously still very much a work in progress. Um, so it's sort of a question of what we've learned so far and what we plan on implementing over the next six months um, to sort of ensure the greater sustainability or the greatest sustainability of this that we can. That we can. Uh, 
I guess my sort of transformation from a commercial archaeologist to a graduate student is complete because I want to start by problematizing everything. Um, and these points may seem sort of obvious, particularly when looking at paper examples, which is why I'm using paper examples, but I don't think we necessarily think of them as quite so obvious when we're talking about digital information. So first of all, looking at Site recording, site recording is obviously not the same thing as publication. You wouldn't ever put your context sheets into a book and send it to the library and expect people to read it. Um, and similarly, the tools we use for site recording are not the same tools as we might need to use for publication. Um, so we write with a pen and paper, we use a printing press to make our books. Um, so I don't think these things in digital formats necessarily need to be the same either. So things that we're using to collect data on site we shouldn't be judging them based on how good they are at publishing data, because that is not what they're for. This is a different purpose here. Um, in the recent Mobilizing the Past workshop in Boston at the end of February, FileMaker is suddenly a very popular choice for a collection of site data. Um, I have some opinions about FileMaker. I think everyone here has some strong opinions about FileMaker. But, but it shouldn't necessarily matter as long as it collects data the, the archaeologists on site should be the ones who are dictating what is the best practice for them in their data collection. Um, and concerns of archival sustainability or publication should be secondary to the needs of the people who are actually collecting the data. Similarly, uh, publication is not the same as archiving. Again, duh. And I'm sorry I had to put an Indiana Jones in reference in there somewhere because I'm talking about something called ARC. Uh, and we think of books in the paper example as somehow sustainable, but anyone who's done research on materials from even the beginning of the 20th century realizes this isn't always the case. Things go out of print, um, things happen to libraries, they get put into like sort of boxes and archives like this and either get lost or damaged or insects eat them or they set on fire or whatever. And so we think of books as being somehow lasting and forever, but they're not. And similarly, digital publications are we putting them up to sort of an unreasonable standard of it must exist forever because that's what all publications do? I would argue all publications don't do that. And similarly, when people publish books, their concern is not, will this book exist in 300 years? Their concern is, I want to publish a book with my ideas in it. Um, so it's a question of whether we're sort of putting data to unreasonable standards compared to how the sort of analog equivalent would, would work. Um, and in this way, the published record is sort of uh, like, I guess it's sort of a dynamic evolving thing. And the goal of publication is really to link your data or to examine your data and link it to some sort of narrative, um, which is not the same as the goal of archiving the data, which is to make that data accessible for people to use in future. Which leads to sort of a question mark, I guess, if recording does not equal publication and publication does not equal archiving, uh, recording, question mark, archiving? Um, it's like high school math. Uh, the and this is a broader question that people have talked about in other sessions and really not the goal here, so I might ask a lot of things and then move on, um, but I'm happy to discuss them afterwards. Is the end game of sort of archaeological site practices really archival data? And also is data the sort of reified data that we all talk about as if it's the, the end goal of archaeology at all? Or does the process matter? Does the creation of narratives matter? Does the interaction of archaeologists on site with local, local populations matter. And if we design all of our site practices about creating this sort of ah, oh, like, like light bulb moment of the data, which must be maintained in some way, I mean, is that really the point of what we're doing? Um, and are, are we really OK with, with this? Um, I'm not sure that all archaeologists are. I'm not sure that I am, to be honest. Um, and this sort of creates a number of secondary questions about if we don't think that archive or that site practices need to be creating archival quality data, then how much processing should we be expected to get from that sort of site practice to archival quality data? Um, are the most sustainable archives the most useful research tools? Um, and should we make this distinction or this acknowledgement that this is a process that it's going to take a lot of time and resources to get from site collection to publication? It's similarly going to take time and resources to get from publication to archiving. Um, and then again, because the, the ARC development team in particular likes to think about this concept of the interface, um, here's Tom Cruise interacting with the interface and minority report. Um, the way that we interact with this data, either Tom Cruise, like touching the screen or most of us on computers, um, has some impact on how that data is generated and also how we think about that data. So if we then sort of divorce that data into a series of text or ASCII files when it's 
archived is that sort of taking away part of our interpretive process and sort of detaching the results from the thing that's created those results. It's sort of an intellectual dishonesty of presuming it's actually correct and pure, and we've, we've taken away those steps, that intellectual process that we've gone through to get to it. Um, this is especially relevant to the ARC team because ARC is sort of built around these concepts of hypertext and linking between various records. And so if you take away all those links that we've used as being central to understanding those records, what are we left with? Um, nothing that really resembles the data as we were actually interacting with it. So how are we going to deal with any of these things at Villa Mania? Um, well, what we've implemented is sort of a two a two-pronged approach. Um, as I discussed, we're holding both stratigraphic narrative and raw data. And so we've um, formatted all of our stratigraphic narrative in a WordPress installation. Um, so we wanted to sort of have this, like, an interface that was sort of understandable and also usable by the authors, as every stratigraphic narrative is, is written by a different author, sort of having some kind of format for publication that the authors were not actually able to interact with or edit themselves was kind of a no-go. And so we used a WordPress as a content management system because it was sort of easy to create and easy to access. Um, it's also easy to embed various media and, and the stratigraphic narrative. Part of the reason we're putting it online is to move away from this stratigraphy as text, which no one terribly wants to read, arguably. And so having as many photos in color, um, integrating spatial data, all of these things is really one of the advantages of using the web to do this type of thing. Um, also conveniently, and you might be able to sort of see here, um, but all of our context records, or when the stratigraphic narrative refers to particular finds or to other trenches, you can all hyperlink all of these materials directly to the raw data. And so there's this sort of embedding, and actually ARC has a plugin, um, for bringing these hyperlinks from the ARC record to a WordPress install. And so you've got this connection between the raw data that's gone into this interpretive narrative and the interpretive narrative yourself. Um, so we've really found thus far um, that this is sort of an extensible approach. Um, it can expand to suit the needs of this project. Uh, it can be customized as much as we need. We're maintaining a little bit of editorial control because we choose what it looks like. Um, and it's sort of for our authors who aren't all necessarily at the same level of technical competence and also for our audience, it looks like, like a website should look, which is sort of convenient and sometimes the most sustainable types of text online are not necessarily the most visually pleasing types of text online. Um, and it's updatable for now. I mean, as we all know, Facebook will die for May, WordPress, Google, all of these things are not actually sustainable. Um, but for the time being, WordPress is a very well-used platform, and it releases periodic updates. And so when we deposit this site um, with Tufts University in Boston, they are, they are happy as an institution to take on the responsibility of updating that WordPress installation. And so using something that they're actually, they've already installed and sort of as an institution have already bought into sort of helps us to, to piggyback on their work. Um, our data at the same time is held in the ARC as it was during excavation. So obviously, already we sort of have this advantage of we are maintaining more or less the interface that we used in the creation and analysis of this data in our online publication. Um, also, it means we could sort of hold our context records, our photography, our plans, all of these things. Because ARC is web-based, this is automatically, or it's very easy for us to integrate this into the, the style sheet of the wider WordPress installation. And so it's sort of, for our audience, a seamless interaction of both text and data, and not this sort of like, here you've read the stratigraphic text, if you want to go to the data, go and look at this completely different thing, or download a spreadsheet, or look at this specialist software. Um, and also, because it's online, sort of we're hoping will facilitate the openness and the reusability of this data. So all of the data of the Villamani website is licensed under a Creative Commons license. Um, I don't know which one I actually picked, and I can't scroll down, but it's free and open for reuse, non-commercial, I suspect. Um, this will be particularly useful for object photos, I think, and maybe for some, we have a lot of pictures of skeletons, if anyone wants one, <laughs> send me an email. Um, but particularly for objects, when people are researching, I think one of the main reasons people look at object catalogs is for this concept of comparanda. And so having a, a catalog of object photos of certain types or pottery or all the different types of materials. Uh, we have a lot of architectural elements, statues, things like that. These are the types of materials that aren't often always so easy to find or so accessible. So 
So we're happy that they're open. Um, the ARC data can be downloaded either as your search results or an entire catalog, either as CSV if you wanted to ingest it into your own whatever, um, or as RSS or Atom feed. So it's sort of helping for web things that want to ingest that information and process it and spit it out in some other way. Um, its online systems are kind of helpful with that. Um, and also working or sort of piggybacking on some of the work of of Fasti Online and their work with the Ariadne project, um, they're working on sort of establishing ways of mapping the ontologies of Fasti and the, the classifications of Fasti to other existing things online. And the benefits of an open source system such as ARC is that when Fasti spends the money developing this, Villamania can ingest those things also. And so there's a, a move to try and also make sure that our data is mapped onto existing things to help people to reuse, to sort of import it from the system and to do to do what they please with it. Um, I mean, this is all well and good, but returning to sort of the problems that I've addressed above, the best tools for web publishing are not necessarily the best, well, in fact, they're not. Um, they're not the best tools for sustainability or, or perhaps for archiving. And how can we really resolve this? Um, I'd sort of left this blank initially because I wanted to put a pithy image or like a, a a thing with complicated workflows and a lot of arrows um, in here. But I guess in a moment of existential crisis or something, um, at the end of a sort of three or four stimulating days of, of conference, I thought I'd just leave it blank. Um, because I think it's a broader question of what does really sustainable web publication or the sustainable web look like at all? Um, what does sustainable publication look like for books, if, if we're being honest, um, or for journals or for e-journals or for data? And, and I think there's so many broader questions, says the skeptical graduate student, um, about what these things are. And so Villamania is working towards them in the best way that we can. Um, but I'm not sure that this is a thing that one project alone should be expected to be able to do, because I think even though there are organizations that are tackling these things in different ways, I, I don't think there's a straightforward set of solutions just yet. Um, but we are, I mean, that doesn't mean we just do nothing, obviously. Um, so although we cannot realistically guarantee the sustainability of ARC and WordPress for eternity, um, we're not just going to put them online and like wipe our hands of it and say, eh, maybe in four years, Tufts will get rid of it. Who cares? We spend a lot of time doing it. Um, I guess sort of borrowing from some of Leif Isaacson's comments earlier, where he was comparing linked data as sort of organic, a thing that has to be willing to change and not a, strat a static infrastructure. I think we're sort of taking a similar approach to online publication, which is something that has to be willing to change. It cannot be considered like a book where it's static and is not printed again. If it is online, there has to be some acknowledgement that it's not going to be a thing which just stays the same way that it does forever. Um, some of the ways that we're thinking of or we're planning on making sure that our data isn't thus lost when it ends um, is a lot of redundancy, sort of a scattershot approach of making sure our data is everywhere, and then some of it, some of it will be fine. Um, so we'll be depositing CSV and ASCII texts of all of the relevant data of the narrative texts um, with a relevant archive, maybe ADS, maybe open context. I'm not sure. Lisa has another plan. Um, but we will be depositing the things that archives like with our archival data. Um, we'll also be taking sort of PDF of the catalogs and of the stratigraphic narratives that people will be able to download. Um, we can deposit those as well. And we're sort of experimenting or thinking of experimenting with WAR files, this kind of concept. Um, Jess Ogden and I were talking about it earlier this week of packaging up the entire website as a website archive. And then, I, to be honest, technically, I have no idea how this might work, but sort of trying to get that so that all of the thing is contained. And then if you have sort of a Wayback Machine in the future, you can which is actually a thing. I'm not just saying, like, if you go back in time. Um, but if you have a, a simulator for your computer, you can then plug in everything and have the website functioning as it was at the time that we created it with all of the hyperlinks, which are so important, with this connection between narrative and text that we see as being fairly important. Um, so I guess we're sort of going for, and I guess also, actually, the fact that our data is open and that our software is open, we're hoping also means that if there is a problem where I no longer want to deal with it, <laughs> which is possible, um, that there's a community that's using this data, then that community is also going to have a stake in making sure that it continues to exist. Um, that if the software that's using the data to, to format it is, is open, then people can take the software and change it or update it as they need. And I'm not the linchpin. Lisa's not. The project isn't the linchpin. Um, so it's sort of a compromise between these um, 
making data that's archival quality, but also making an online publication which is useful to users. Um, I guess to conclude with a second <laughs> XKCD comic, uh, this is still a work in progress. So as I said, we'll be completing, and, and, and so I can't, I can't give you the website because it's not done, uh, in late 2015. And we're going to release it at the same time as the print volume, so we're not sort of bombarding the internet with data when they can't see the print thing that we kind of expect them to go hand in hand. Um, but we have learned some things thus far that I think sort of are helping me or us as a project reconcile some of the problems I identified earlier. So, I mean, I think we're sort of coming to the conclusion that sustainable publication may never really be entirely possible, even in, the cons even in print. Um, and so we'll do the best that we can, but we're not letting sustainability trump the concerns of, is our publication useful and is our publication something that people will actually want to deal with? Um, so as long as, and I think the same could probably be said, although this isn't a, a discussion about site recording, could probably be said about site recording as well. And so I think as long as both our recording and our publication solutions are creating data that includes the relevant um, meta information and that can be sort of successfully exported um, without getting bogged down in proprietary formats, as, as data from ARC can do, um, then it's okay for us to divorce these processes of data collection and publication and archiving so that we're using the best tool for each step of the process. Um, and so we're sort of using the best tool for each step of that process or trying to implement the best tool for each step of the process while still keeping an eye on sort of the afterlife of, afterlife of our project data um, and, and I guess trying to ensure its sustainability in, in that way. Thank you.